Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Stacy, and I'm a bookseller and the events coordinator at Belmont Books. Belmont Books, for those of you who are not familiar with us, is an independent and locally owned bookstore in Belmont, Massachusetts. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that we have two more events coming up this week. Tomorrow night, we have Serena Perek, author of No Refuge in Conversation with David Livingstone Smith. And Thursday night, we have a father-daughter poetry event with Maxime and Tatiana Schreyer. You can register for these events on our website, belmontbooks.com, which is also where you can purchase tonight's book, Olive Bright Virginia. If you have any concerns during the presentation, you can send a message to me in the chat section. And if you have any questions for either of the authors, please type them into the Q&A section and we'll get to as many questions as we can, although we've got a small group tonight, so I suspect we'll be able to get to all of your questions. We're very excited to welcome Stephanie and Alyssa. I want to tell you a little bit about them and then I will turn the event over to them. Stephanie Graves was born on an army base in Arizona and spent most of her life on the outskirts of Houston. She has a degree in electrical engineering from UT Austin and worked as a product engineer on automotive application microcontrollers. She married her high school sweetheart and is the mom of two nearly grown boys and two dogs named Indiana Jones and Short Round. Stephanie is a beginner knitter, voracious reader, color enthusiast, and self-professed connoisseur of British mysteries of all sorts. In addition to Olive Bright Pigeoneer, Stephanie is the author of four novels under the pseudonym Alyssa Goodnight. Alyssa Maxwell is the acclaimed author of the Gilded Newport Mysteries and the Lady and Lady's Maid Mysteries series. She knew from a young age that she wanted to write novels. Growing up in New England and traveling to Great Britain fueled a passion for history, while a love of puzzles drew her to the mystery genre. Alyssa and her husband live in Florida, where she loves to watch BBC productions, sip tea in the afternoons, and delve into the past. And as I just found out, she loves to zap mosquitoes. <laughs> and without further ado, I will turn the event over to them. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Stephanie, did you want to do a reading or would you like to get into some questions about your book? Uh, I'm happy to do a reading. I, I've um, selected a section right at the, well, shortly after the very beginning. And uh, just a little bit of background. Um, Olive is saying a goodbye to her best friend, George, who's leaving for um, Royal Air Force training. And she's trying to get him to take a pigeon with him. So she's, okay, why can't you take her, she demanded. This is the real thing, Olive, the war office, official business, packing a stowaway, he eyed the basket with exasperation, is surely grounds for an unpleasant sort of punishment. Olive's lips twisted with nostalgia. George could always be depended upon to muster a cautious, sensible objection to every impulsive suggestion. Who would temper her wilder impulses while he was gone? She propped the basket under her arm and released the catch. A rounded gray head poked itself curiously into the conversation as if to say, who would dare object? George's shoulders slumped further and Olive grinned encouragingly. It's not as if the RAF is anti-pigeon, she reminded him, quite the opposite. These birds have been carrying messages since the beginning of the war, selflessly doing their bit. Before that, it was the great war and before that, save it, he said dryly. Poppins is a racer. She's trained for this sort of thing, Olive pressed. Release her wherever the fancy strikes. The further away, the better, and she'll fly right home. She flashed a broad smile, with no one the wiser. He let his gaze roll away, a hint that he was caving. But Poppins is a civilian, he said, his tone no longer quite as adamant. For now, Olive countered, her brows lifting defiantly. She is at his majesty's service. She attempted an awkward curtsy. You know, Dad notified the Pigeon Service Committee that our lofts are available for the war effort, she reminded him. We simply haven't received our certification. I'm sure it's an administrative oversight, she said crisply. I'll stop there. Yeah, I actually fell in love with Olive during that scene. I just, I loved her spunk. I loved her determination. And I really loved her, her um, relationship with George. And I'll admit at first, I wasn't sure if it might become a romantic relationship, I don't want to give anything away, but I, I really enjoyed her friendship with him. Um, so interest in World War II fiction has really surged in recent years. Can you tell us what drew you to the time period? 
I have been a little bit fascinated with World War II ever since I learned about it in um, during my school years. I just was completely struck by the fact that it, it's such a time of um, a, like a paradox of the, really the good of humanity and the very worst and how they coexisted and, and really certain people really stepped up and, and did amazing things selflessly and courageously. And um, I just, it's all, that's always been, I guess, in the back of my mind. So when I decided to switch over from writing romance to writing mystery, I automatically knew I wanted to do a historical mystery and that it was gonna have to be set during World War II. Yeah, you know, it's funny, my father and I just had a recent conversation. Um, he uh, didn't fight in the war, he was a little bit too young, but he does remember, albeit in this country and not in England, how people really did pull together and had a, a, that common goal and that common spirit right. to, you know, do their best to, for the best outcome. Um, there were so many aspects of uh, women's involvement in the war that you had to choose from. What drew you to a pigeoneer? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, when I took I took my kids to see the movie Valiant, like probably 15 years ago now, and I don't know if you've seen that movie, but it's I... basically it's it's a cartoon about pigeons and uh, loosely based on their effort in the war. And I came out of that movie. I mean, I didn't think it was the most fantastic movie, but I came out of the movie just kind of amazed because not only had I not ever heard about that aspect of things, but it just seemed kind of miraculous that they could um, be trusted or that they, they were um, re reliable enough to be able to carry messages usefully for, for the war effort. So then, I mean, that, that basically when I decided on the historical mystery and all of, all of my past interests kind of came flooding back to me at the same time, the, the fascination with the pigeons and the interest in World War II and it all just came together. Right, I, I knew very little about pigeons actually when I started to read your book. I knew they were intelligent, I had heard that, but I didn't, I didn't know how intelligent and you really turned them into noble heroic figures for me. Oh, awesome. Which was, yeah, which was just great. <laughs> Were there female pigeoneers at the time, or is Olive a special case? Um, there were. I don't know how many there were, and there is a mention in the author's note about uh, one in particular. Her husband, I cannot. I think it's Lady Manning, Lady Mannington Buller, or something like that. Um, her husband was a, a a member of Parliament, I think, and so he was in London, and so she stayed in the village where they had a house and she was actually working for uh, the secret intelligence service well not not that exactly but effectively the the baker street of the book which was a special operations executive and she was keeping the pigeons and then they'd send someone the um, uh, motorcycle to pick up the messages and so yes i i have found information about her i'm not sure if she was kind of a singular woman or if there were, were more, but since there were, I mean, lofts were left behind and men had to go sometimes go fight, you would think that there might've been more than her. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. Were there any anything that took, anything that took you by surprise about pigeons and their abilities? Oh, pretty much everything took me by surprise because okay. I didn't really know anything, but um, some things, I guess that, that were very interesting to me were the fact that that they can maintain speeds of like 60 miles an hour over hundreds of miles, which seems incredible. And they had to be, they don't like to fly uh, over water and they don't like to fly at night. So they had to be kind of conditioned and trained to do that because a, a lot of the, uh, the trips or the missions were right across the channel. So then they'd be dropped by a parachute kind of in the very late hours, early hours in the morning. So it is dark. And if they wanted to release one right away saying, you know, we've arrived, things are good. We've, we've met up with this resistance group, whatever they, that would have been effectively, it would have been dark. It would have been flying back over water. So really they had to kind of, you, you know, make some changes in their training. And also I think, I'm not sure I knew 
before I started researching this book, that, that they, their journeys are mostly or traditionally one directional. So they have their home loft and they want to get back to their home loft. So you have to take them somewhere and then they return to their loft with the message rather than it's not really a relaying back and forth with messages. So that, that, that has some limitations. Yeah, interesting. That was really a surprise for me too, that they could find their way home from such a far no. distance and under circumstances where they couldn't even see the landmarks that they were flying over. I mean, that, that's just amazing. Um, your, your story is filled with so many fascinating little details about the war and the time period that I really didn't know about. Um, you obviously did tons and tons of research into everything, every aspect of village life in that time and, and, and the war. How did you balance that and yet be able to write such an entertaining story, fast paced, really engaging story? Well, thank you, first of all. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, I, think, I think it helped that when I started writing the book, I really only had olive and the pigeoneering aspect. And so then I, I was basically trying to flesh out the village and, and all of her, uh, all the supplemental characters. So I did all of my research and kind of built the characters based on what was happening at the time and what they would have what they would have been working on and how things were. So I, I hope it was a little more organic that way because I didn't have any preconceived ideas about it. But what I personally found a little difficult in kind of balancing the history with the story is trying to make sure that when you're, you're being authentic to make sure that there's sufficient context for a modern day reader to really understand without you just kind of trying to dump a load of information mm -hmm. or explanations. Right. So I don't know how you feel about how, if, that, if that's difficult for you or it's, it's pretty straightforward in your writing. Yeah, well, I, I think like you, I try to keep all of the historical details within the character's perspective from their point of view. So if she is engaging with something, some kind of historical detail, that's how the reader sees it. So there is no info dump. It's just part of the character's life. And sure. I thought Olive, you know, I was living in that world through Olive beautifully. Um, but speaking of Olive, I mean, the boundaries for women back then were very restrictive. Um, and this is something that faces, I think, all of us historical writers is, is being able to write a strong female protagonist within those restrictions. I think that I maybe had a little bit of an easier time in, with World War II timeframe, just because there was there were so many expectations on or women were more encouraged to to do more than they ever had because it was kind of a war that was for all the civilians were all involved in the war and so the men were in were had their they either were off fighting or they were in um the the jobs that kept them from fighting and so women were then had to fill up pick up the slack and do all sorts of things that they wouldn't otherwise be doing. And so I think in some ways that, that allowed me a little bit more freedom. And while, while Olive was certainly, certainly did feel restricted, she was also, and is, is as I'm trying to move forward with the series, is trying to really make an impact and, and make a few changes and really show what she can do. So, uh, certainly there are restrictions, but there's also, she's, she's able to get her foot in the door with that in that time period, period, I think. Right. I think also they had already lived through World War I. And I know that in my own research, women did quite a lot uh, during those years. They, they worked in the factories. They, they basically did what they did during World War II. Um, they farmed they ran businesses, they, they did all the things that the men had been doing until they had to go off and fight. And Olive had her mother's legacy uh, that she grew up with uh, of her mother, uh, which I believe she was a driver, ambulance driver. 
Yes. During World War yes. One. Yes. So uh, would you say that they almost had a, pr a practice run for what women then were doing during World War Two? I mean, it was only 20 years. So it was in their right. living memory, some of them. Uh, right. And certainly within the generational memory that women had done these things. Yes, certainly they there were um, there there was a precedent set. I, right. I don't. I mean, I haven't done very much World War One research, so I, I didn't know the extent of of mm -hmm. how many of the organizations and types of jobs and roles that women could fill then. But um, certainly, yes, it it seems to be um, a, a lot of opportunities for women. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, uh, at the end of both wars, the women were given pats on the head and told to right. go home and <laughs> raise families. <laughs> True. <laughs> Which, um, you know, and after both wars, there were women who did not want to do that and who didn't do that. Um, so I, I always like to say that there are exceptions in every time period and there are always strong women. Um, and there are women that break boundaries, I think, from the beginning of time on. Agreed. Yeah. Um, do you have any historical figures at all that inspired some of your characters? It... Um, well, there was the, the lady, the lady that was a engineer. Oh, right, right. Um, and let's see. I don't know that so much in, I mean, I do have se uh, several uh, accessory characters that are actually based on real people but i think the the major or the, or the this the uh, olive and captain aldridge are both more of a kind of compilation of of research and of different different people that i've um, learned about in my in my um reading so they're mm -hmm. not really they're not really specifically based on anyone mm -hmm. um we were just talking about the parallels between the two wars. How about parallels between then and now? I mean, I, I noticed in my research, both with my Newport books and my Lady and Ladies Made books, a lot of parallels in society that kind of taught me that, you know, times change, but people really don't. So what do you see along those lines? Uh, well, definitely, I think that the the way that everyone was, or the, at, everyone like British home front, American home front, they were all able to kind of come together and do whatever was necessary, reminded me of the beginning of, specifically the beginning of the, with the pandemic where people were really using their skill and uh, creativity and innovation to, to switch over factories and to create face masks and face shields and, um, feed frontline workers quickly and all, all that sort of thing. It just seemed like we were all kind of in it together and to some extent still are. But I mean, right at the beginning, it was really kind of put me in, in mind of, the, of that time and during World War II. Right. And yeah. And some of it was even like that kind of cottage industry where we had women right. making masks from home and, and, you know, shipping them out to whoever needed them to, to healthcare workers. So yeah, that, that's a really great point. Um, how, what, was there a scene in the book that was very difficult to write? I'm actually thinking of one myself <laughs> and <laughs> from the book. And I'm wondering if um, um, it might coincide with, with I, yours. Well, I think the hardest ones for me to write were the ones about pigeons, just because I am not, I mean, I'm not a pigeon fancier. I don't have firsthand pigeon experience. So I, I really wanted them to be authentic, but not like a instruction manual or anything like that. So I was trying to be very careful to, to kind of make it feel like I knew what I was talking about and that I could conceivably, you know, be all of just knowing what I was doing and, and there, everything was going to come across that way. But uh, another scene, a specific scene, um, hmm, I don't know, nothing's hitting me. What, what, yeah. what, what, well, I, 
I don't want to uh, okay. give out any spoilers, but a, a couple of the ones that I thought might have been hard to write involved pigeons also. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what was e what did you find easy? What what just kind of you know maybe melded naturally and you just were able to, you know, have one of those days where it just wrote itself? Was there anything like that? There was. As a matter of fact, the, the scenes that involve uh, Olive and Jamie kind of bantering or arguing with each other, I think that's the romance writer in my past. I, I mean, I feel like I can I can do that all day. So uh, yeah, those are my easiest scenes to write, I think. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, I would agree with you because they really went back and forth. They were very snappy. <laughs> I loved I loved the chemistry and yet the conflict. Um, I can't see them uh, having a romantic interlude anytime too soon. Um, you know, you get those little sparks, but I just in reading the book, I get the feeling that this is going to be a, a, a one step Low forward, burn. two steps back kind of situation. And I think that's going to do a lot to keep the book, very, the books, the series very lively. I think uh, you might be right. <laughs> and, and don't you think a lot of mystery readers enjoy that touch of romance in, in I think, their books? I think, yes. I, th I mean, I think that's just human nature that, yeah. that you know, that, that kind of thing happens when, when two people are thrown together. And so, I mean, I think it's just kind of normal and a little bit expected in some cases. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I'd, I'd like it myself when I'm reading. Right. And it creates a nice uh, character arc, a nice story arc. True. true. Overall through the series. So mm -hmm. I, I always enjoy that. Um, okay. So we talked about hardest and easiest <laughs> scenes. How about other than Olive, of course, do you have a favorite character? Who was just a, a blast to write about? Well, actually, my favorite to write about was Miss Hustleby. So oh. just because I love to write a character that doesn't, she can say anything she wants. She has no qualms about just putting it all out there. Mm -hmm. It is no kind filter. of freeing. She has no filter. Right, exactly. And and you put some really wonderful details into her character, the, the tapping umbrella. Oh. <laughs> and, and it wasn't just something Olive noticed because somebody later on said, oh, you know, no tapping umbrella. Oh. <laughs> like, like, like it was she it was missing and, and somebody actually noticed it um so that's her thing so i would guess she she was your most fun to write yeah, definitely did you have any that you didn't expect to take a front seat in the story but yet they spoke to you and, and demanded a larger part mm. maybe maybe a couple partly because i was i did plot out plot out the whole novel mm -hmm. and i obviously i plotted out who the the killer was going to be and everything but i i got part way through and i kind of changed my mind a little bit and so the story was had to be tweaked obviously so certain storylines had to be adjusted and and built up a little bit so yes i i don't want to say anything spoilery right. but right. Uh, i think that there were a couple that that were like that mostly because of changed my mind right, right, <laughs> that right. Was my, yeah. first, my first mystery so uh -huh. i i actually wondered if it could have been um the boy i don't remember his name uh, but he's like a little brother to olive oh, right. and the and his friend the girl guide because i thought well, they were just too cute um, she almost has the potential to grow up to be another Miss Hustleby because she's just into everything and she has her opinions. And of course, he was um, very much a brother to Olive and, and, you know, just wanted to be in on the secrets and help with the pigeons. So I, I actually did wonder if they maybe um, demanded that extra role in the story, but you planned them that way. Well, no, that was another one of, uh, I did plan that the boy whose name's Jonathan, Jonathan was going to be an evacuee but yeah his his story arc changed a little bit mm -hmm. from from what I originally intended but and then Henrietta who's the girl guide mm -hmm. I mean she just I guess 
she fascinates me because I read a whole book on the girl guides and what they accomplished. And so she, I'm trying to mm -hmm. channel some of that into her personality and character. And I, um, yeah, so I'm, they're, I'm really enjoying writing the two of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the inclusion of the Girl Guides. I was a Girl Scout and a Girl Scout leader and my daughters were Girl Scouts. So I think <laughs> it's, it's well, it's fun to see that historical and British version of something that we know so well here in this country. Right. Um, but speaking of Mrs. Hustleby, can we talk about that spam cake? <laughs> <laughs> Is, was there a such thing as a spam cake? I, I immediately went to the Guernsey Literary um, and potato peel pie society, oh, okay. you know, something like that. Like during war, you don't have sugar, you don't maybe have the extra flour. So you make these right. weird, con yeah, so. Well, I've come across two separate recipes, believe it or not, one of them being, or two separate styles. One of them being a regular sweet cake that the spam is just worked into. And then it has the whipped potato icing, but the whip, the potatoes are also mixed with sugar. So it's effectively supposed to be a sweet dessert. Uh -huh. But I've also come across just like a little, this the one in the book is supposed to be more like a, I mean, you can't tell from looking at it, but it's supposed to be more like a meatloaf kind of with actual potatoes for the icing. So mm -hmm. mine was more savory, but there is a recipe for sweet sweet that sounds oh, yes and i've never tried either and have no plans to at this time oh, oh i think you should I, I think you owe it to your readers to make a spam cake well if and I was show us to, pictures i think i would go savory personally i don't know that i, I can I mix do. my spam with sugar uh, well uh, the savory almost really sounds like a shepherd's pie Yes, you know, true. the addition of some gravy and some vegetables, you could almost get away with calling it a shepherd's pie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I felt her pain when she saw what she thought was frosting, real oh, frosting. Right. She thought, oh, somebody used their sugar rations on a yeah. real cake. And then oh, <laughs> it was, oh, how disappointing. <laughs> I know, right? That yeah, would have been a uh, another really fun addition to the book was Olive's love of Ag Agatha Christie um, and, and her channeling her inner Hercule Poirot. Um, have you thought about uh, using uh, any of Agatha Christie, you know, Hercule Poirot's plot to, and, you know, doing a take on something like that? I have. Not I don't mean. I don't that. mean repeating the plot, but taking a little inspiration and applying it to your um, your series. Um, I well, at this point, she's still. I mean, I'm working on. I've written book two, and I'm working on book three. At this point, she's still. I mean, she has various books and plots and uh, um, solving techniques in the back of her mind. And so she is kind of drawing on that as, as she's trying to uh, work things out, solve mm -hmm. mysteries. But um, I think personally, I think I'd really have to do some serious research back into, I, I have read almost all uh -huh. the Agatha Christie mysteries, yeah. but I don't even know that I remember most of them. It's been a while. So I'd have to do some serious research right, to try right. to bring some of that in, but yes, different characters are mentioned besides Hercule. Mm -hmm. um, Hastings gets pretty regular mentions and um, some of the other, I mean, Miss Marple is mentioned sometimes. Uh -huh. And so she's she's not completely die, die hard Poirot, but mm -hmm. um, he is her favorite. Right, right. Well, in your village, there could really be a potential for Miss Marple too, I noticed. You know, yes, the, absolutely. The little village women. <laughs> um, the setting really was a character in itself, and I wonder, do you do you look at your settings that way? Is it a living, breathing character to you? I think so, yes. And I think it in this World War II set novel, I think it really helped kind of tie everything together and was really like a almost the war was like a setting as, well, how to say this, like the war in this particular village was was a setting because of course every village is going to have its own schemes and worries and characteristics and all of that and i think it was a 
good way to kind of explain or bring together the whole what was going on in the whole village like how they all came together and how they what what were some of the different projects they worked on and how they were dealing with things and so it, i i felt like it kind of grounded everything and, and I, I mean i do i do feel like it, it's a it's a character i loved the way the village presented a microcosm of the war not the bombs falling, not the planes necessarily flying overhead and the armies marching, but how the war affected everyday life, you know, what it meant to individuals. And I, I think putting it in a, in a village is really the best way to do that, to show life goes on, but it's different, you know, right. we have think, struggles, you know, we're, we're getting by, but it's not what it was. Right. And I think that's, much lesser known what um, all of the, uh, the the different tasks undertaken by people on the home front i mean certainly there are parts that are well known but there are many parts that i mean i was amazed reading about all the things the women's institute did, did and the girls girl guides did and the royal observer corps who was in charge of plane spotting and uh, all of those things i mean I, now, I didn't learn any of those things in my, my history classes. Right. And I haven't really read about almost any of them in World War II fiction that I've read. So, I mean, I think that was part of what made me so excited to try to weave in more um, little details that were, were lesser known. Yeah. You included an interesting uh, characteristic with uh, Olive's stepmother, who has MS. Is this, was this inspired by something personal or uh, where, how did that come about? Um, it was, it's not personal. I do, I have a sort of a family friend who is suffering with MS, but um, I also wanted to make sure that at, at the beginning, Olive is trying to she, she would actually like to leave the village and do something more significant than she believes is, is, is going to be, um, except, or is, is going to be available for her in the village. And so she's trying to weigh up her, what she's leaving behind versus her own interests. And so I, I kind of wanted to give her more of a reason of needing to stay. So I, I needed something that some, condition or trouble that her another family member was having so she's she's want, wants to stay because of her pigeons and because of Jonathan who's a new evacuee that's moved in and she's helped her father in his veterinary surgery but I, I thought that would add another element and also a good kind of a dynamic between them of just to sh her really a connection between them and her really helping out and and uh that's, that's how that played out. Yeah. But, well, I, th I think it added another level of heroism, but on a personal level, you know, not to do with the war, but this woman's own struggle and the family rallying to help her and Olive wanting to be there for her. So it, and it was I, a, I tried to play you know, that up in the village too, of them mm -hmm. all trying to, you know, mm -hmm. make sure that she is involved and trying to get her to village events and things like that. Right. So what can we expect next from Olive? Well, in, in book two, which comes out next February, so a long time from now, um, she is, she actually be, is a, officially becomes a Fanny or a member of the first aid uh, nursing yeomanry, which they work in, in conjunction with the special operations executive, which in this book is Baker Street. And so she's like, she's kind of official now working at the, the manor house that, that um, Captain Aldridge is working in. And she's more of, more in a, work, working in a more general capacity as well as Pigeoneer. And there is a murder. And so she has to put her sleuthing hat on again to uh, solve that. Right. And I guess we're going to see a lot more of Captain Aldridge at the same yes. time because now yes. they're working together. Correct. In a yeah. more official be capacity. <laughs> um, so great. Um, well, 
what inspires you? What what kind of books do you read? Do you read um, mostly historicals or do you mix it up with some contemporary? I do read mostly historical mystery, mystery leaning towards historical mysteries. I used to read almost exclusively romance and then my reading started gradually switched over to mystery and then I started thinking well maybe my writing should switch over too. So that was what inspired me to switch to make attempt at writing a mystery. And um, yes, I, I uh, really like the, I'm not a huge fan of thrillers just because I like a, a nice cozy read where nothing's too graphic or too, you know, just shocking. So a, a nice historical mystery is right up my alley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same here. I, I read almost exclusively historical, whether it's historical fiction, historical mystery. Um, it, it, my head is just always stuck in the past for whatever I reason. I, <laughs> it feels more comfortable. <laughs> do you have trouble uh, switching between your two series mentally? No, I really don't. I, for whatever reason, I am, it's easy for me to keep them separate. The only thing that I've done sometimes is that when I go to write I say a Newport book, those are in first person and my lady and ladies made books are in third person because I have dual uh, sleuths and I go into both their POV. Right. Um, so sometimes I'll, I'll mix that up when I start a new book. But other than that, I really, I don't. Um, the time periods are different enough. The characters are different. And of course, one is set in England. The other one is set in Newport here. So I, it, I just am able to make that switch. You know, it's like, turn the switch. I'm here or there now. Um, they both feel like home. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's and, great. Um, yeah, I'm always very happy to get back to whatever group I'm writing. Um, it's always feels good to get back into Emma Cross's shoes and, and be in Newport. Um, that one, I will say, is a little bit more personal to me because my husband's roots there and uh, people that we still have living up there. Um, and I have uh, certain people that will go and research things for me now that I can't go, nice. we, we had to miss our trip. Um, oh yeah, that was something else. I, I know that you had said you had been to England, was it a while ago? I, I have, ago, been, well, effectively I've not been to England. I've been to Scotland and only stopped off at the airport in England. But okay. um, <laughs> yes, I, I went for work to Scotland and did very, very little sightseeing, sadly. But when all of the, pandemic issues are, are over and travels back on. I am really hoping to get to travel in England and see some of the, the spots that that inspired the different um, settings and locales in um, right. Olive Bright. Yeah, there, there's always a, a question going back and forth. Does a writer need to be in the area that she's writing about or can she research it? And I honestly feel that it can work either way. I, I said, like, I was just no. going to say, especially, <laughs> especially now with the internet, there's so much available. Right. We have Google Earth. I mean, we can literally see three dimensionally right. what we're, you know, I've, what we would otherwise have to go there to see. I've traveled um, down some some roads on Google Earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, same here. And I think you can get an affinity for a place through that kind of research. Yes, so, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I think we have some questions here. Let's see. Where are we here? Oh, will there be a sequel to Olive Bright? I think <laughs> the answer to that was yes. Yes, there will be. We have a lovely comment from Pam, uh, also from Pamela. She asked that question and she said, I just finished the novel and loved it. Oh, yay. So did I, Pamela. <laughs> how many olive, oh, how many will they be? And will they all be set during the war and continue with stories about the pigeons? That's actually a very good question. Do you, uh, you know, see if the series runs, say for years, going past the war or will you keep it? You know, a writer can play with time. We don't have to go year by year by year. Sure. And right now I'm contracted for three books, but I am hoping that uh, it will, I, I can continue Olive's story. I mean, I have a lot of ideas. I mean, pigeons really were 
um, heavily used throughout the war in, in, in different ways and in many different locales. So I think that I could come up with all sorts of storylines. And as to after the war, I, they, I think sh very shortly after the war, the National Pigeon Service was disbanded. So I'm not, I'd have to go in some other direction for yeah. all of Yeah. Are there still uh, active pigeon fancy clubs? Fancier clubs? How would you say that? Um, I, is it still a thing? It is still a thing. <laughs> yes. Okay. And um, I, there, there definitely are clubs in the U.S. and Britain, and I, Belgium, I think, has is a very strong uh, contingent of fanciers. But I think lately, the um, largest or the, the the most interest is is uh, coming out of uh, China, and all of the. I don't know if you've seen some of the news about how pigeons are being auctioned off for this, these tremendous amounts of money for breeding purposes, racing pigeons, but it's, it's just amazing. Interesting. Let's see. Ah, uh, how many Olive Bright books will there be? Um, will your series be based in World War II or will it also place, oh, we kind of just talked about that. Will it go into the 40s and 50s? How did you get interested in writing? This is from Maureen. Do you have any other special teachers or mentors? Another good question. Um, in terms of writing, I would say no, but I did have a really excellent, well, two really excellent uh, history teachers when I was in high school. And while I was more of a math and science girl, I mean, those were my strong suits history and English were actually my favorites. I wasn't as good at those, but they were my favorites. And these two teachers really made it all come alive. So, I mean, everything was so interesting. I mean, I, I still remember having to have a discussion about the Peloponnesian War, which I've not used any of that information, but I mean, it, it, was, it, it was, they made it all fascinating. Fascinating, yeah. So do you belong to a critique group or a, a writer's organization, a chapter of the MWA? That's the Mystery Writers of America, for those who don't know. I have not yet. I have a, a, a critique, critique partner. I do not, I'm not in a larger group. And I, when I was a romance writer, which was relatively recently, I did belong once upon a time to Romance Writers of America, but I have not dipped my foot into any mystery writing groups yet, although I do need to do that. You should, yes. <laughs> I highly recommend them. Uh, you mentioned Gustav, Gustav the Pigeon from World War II. Are you familiar with Cher Ami from World War II? And this is from Ronald. Cher Ami, I believe, is the World War I pigeon, if I'm correct. I, I did read some information about Cherami. I think, in fact, I think, I believe if, if I'm right, this is the pigeon that was brought information back severely injured, like with a missing leg and a missing eye maybe, which is very tragic oh. and yet still managed to deliver the message, which is unbelievable. But yes, I have read about it, but I, thought that Jeremy was World War One. I. I could be wrong. Yeah. Let's see. Another one might have popped up. Ah. Uh, yes, correct. World War One, also from Ronald. And oh, correct yeah. about the injuries. So you do know your pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question for both of you. Um, you both mentioned liking historical mysteries and I was wondering if you could give our audience some recommendations. I actually I belong to a group called Sleuths in Time where a group of historical mystery writers and you can find us on Facebook and we have an amazing group of writers. Um, I've, I tried to name them all. I know I'm going to forget somebody. <laughs> Um, Nancy Harriman writes the old mysteries or the mysteries of old San Francisco. They are fabulous. Uh, Victoria Thompson with her uh, Gaslight Mysteries and her newer um, 
Oh my gosh, I forgot the name of the series, but it's, it's set during uh, World War I. Um, D.E. Ireland, who has written the Eliza Doolittle mysteries. Ashley Weaver, uh, she has um, a new series set during World War II also. And uh, her 1930s Emory Ames mysteries. Uh, there's, there's, there's more of us. Um, please just go and look at Sleuths in Time on um, Facebook. We also have a website, and I, I think there's something there for everyone. And I would additionally recommend um, Deanna Rayburn and Alan Bradley. Let's see, um, Susan Elliott McNeil. Agatha Christie. <laughs> Just, of course. <laughs> um, so both of you also wondering how it has been writing during the pandemic and getting books out during the pandemic and has that changed your writing habits and, you know, sort of how are things different? Okay. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to start at the same time here. It has not changed my work day much. Writers are solitary. So the isolation has been hard because I am used to going out maybe once or twice a month and, and meeting up with a friend or several or my critique group has been suspended. Uh, we normally met at each other's houses every two weeks. So I really miss that. But as far as the daily writing, it's really gone on much as it always has. Um, there's definitely been a stress factor in the past year that's gotten in the way of some creativity, but I, I feel like I have my deadlines. I have two deadlines a year. I can't make excuses and I just absolutely need to sit down and get the writing done every day. My schedule actually has changed because before I had a senior in high school and a sophomore in college and neither of them were home very often. And now they're pretty much home all the time. And there's various video game noises, musical instrument noises, all sorts of things going on. And it's, personally, I'm the, I'm the type of writer that doesn't have any other, any music playing, any, I have difficult time concentrating. So like if anybody's having a conversation, if the TV's on, I've got to kind of put myself into a super quiet spot to really keep my concentration. So that has been challenging, but um, I'm working it out. But definitely it's solitary. I mean, I, I was used to basically being alone from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., which, which was great for writing. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, thank you both so much. This was really interesting. Um, I see that you know, our audience is really excited about future Olive Bright books. So I know they'll look forward to that. Really appreciate you both being with us. And thank and you so much for audience. having us. Uh, yes, thank you pleasure. very much. It was fun. You're very welcome. To our audience, thank you for coming. Philmontbooks.com is where you can order the books and see our future events. And we hope to see you at another one soon. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Good night.